Hello and welcome to This is Metal with Tom Collier. Our special guest today is a major player for, um, been a big part of the LA rock scene. Early on, he was involved in um, two two huge bands, Quiet Riot and and Dawkins, that would go on to have huge success. Now, Greg, you were involved with those bands um, very early on before either one had any kind of real success. And you're, you've you been doing your own thing with the Greg Leon invasion for years. We're going to get all um, into that. So, um, I'll, I'll let you start off uh, this week, Tom. Um, anything you want to ask, Greg? Yeah, I mean, I, I first of all, I love your music. I got a chance. I listened oh. to all your songs on there. Very cool. Love the love it. You're a vocalist and as a guitar player. And I do the same stuff. But how was? Are you still at the Randy Rhodes Music Institute? I, I read no, something. About no, it. I haven't been there since uh, 19, 19... I don't even remember. It was like the end of the of the eighties. Eighties, yeah. Okay, so yeah. like Randy? 88, 89, something like that. Okay. So Randy was still there. Did you meet Randy? What's that? Was Randy still there with you? No, he was with. Uh, he had gone with Ozzy already, oh, and that's okay. why I was took over his students because he wasn't around anymore. I'm, okay. I'm plugging in the speaker so it sounds better for me on my end. Yeah, he uh, he got the gig with Ozzy. And so uh, I was Randy's favorite guitar player. And, he, you know, we were pretty good buddies. And uh, uh, he asked me if I, you know, when he told me, Kevin and him called me up. Kevin and Randy called me up one morning and, and asked me if I was interested in, you know, joining the band because Randy got the gig with Ozzy. And I said, yeah, we <laughs> rehearsed at the same place, a place in Burbank called uh, Vision Rehearsal Studios. So we were always running into each other and we were playing parties all the time on the weekends and, you know, three, four, 500 people would show up. And lots of times Quiet Riot would show up, you know, Drew, uh, uh, the original bass player, I can't think of his name right now. Um, anyways, it'd be three Drew and eight, Kevin and Randy. And, well, Drew was the drummer, yeah. And they'd just get up and play on our equipment and, you know, be a surprise for everybody at the party of Quiet Riot's playing there. So we became friends. We hung out together, went to parties together and stuff. And, uh, you know, so it was kind of a natural thing. I was right there all the time anyways with him. And I just fit right in there and we did it and uh, had some great shows, had a lot of fun. But Kevin, as most people know, was a very hard guy to get along with. And it's too bad because he had a lot of talent, but he just was very abrasive. And uh, I it got to the point where I just said, you know, it's not fun anymore playing with, with him. I still good friends with Drew. We talk, you know, and all the time and not all the time, but we talk. And uh, we went and visited him and his wife. My wife and I went over there to Hawaii, uh, Kauai, and we spent, I think, nine or 10 days over there. And we uh, celebrated our birthdays together and wow. just had a great time talking about the old days and how fun it was and how much bullshit it was, too, at the same time, you know? You know. Wow, wow. And, and so, um, and of course, people know you also played with Doc in early on. and Yeah. Um, and I was curious, like, um, so were you before, were you in Dawkins before George or after? No, 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 I was before. Oh, that's what I and, thought, uh, yeah. We, yeah, we went and uh, went over to, it was funny because Don had been after me for a year or two to play with him. He saw me play at the Rock Corporation, opening up for him, and he really liked what I did. And my road crew accidentally packed his marshals into my equipment van. And I get this phone call the next day and he goes, hey, uh, this is Don from, you know, I think, I think they were already called docking. I don't think it was still airborne. And he goes, I think you got my equipment. I go, no, nah, I don't think so. And he goes, no, nah, I think you do. And uh, so he, I go up, well, he goes, well, would you check? And I go, of course I'll check. So I go, call me back in five minutes. So I went up to my equipment truck. Sure enough, his old marshals run these little baby marshal heads from the sixties, the best ones, you know, and anyways, they were all in there. And so I called him, he called me back and, I gave him my address and he came and picked him up and we started talking and he goes, man, we should do a band together, Greg, we, with your voice, my voice. And, you know, we put a good band together. And uh, so anyways, I was got the, the uh, you know, the Debro gig after that. And uh, towards the end, I was very unhappy. It just wasn't fun. It was too much arguing and everything was his way or no way. And it just got to be not fun. And uh, Don called me up one day and told this, told me that, and I've said this a million times in interviews, he had the secret phrase, I have European dates. Yeah, so yeah. I felt, okay, okay, talk to me. What are you saying? So we had about 20 dates over in Europe. And uh, I'm thinking Jimi Hendrix. He had to leave the country to, yeah, to make it, make yeah. it, you know. Yeah. So we, we went over there and killed him. 
killed him. And then Dieter Dirks from the Scorpions came and saw us, took us into his studio in Cologne, Germany. Yeah. We did a five song demo and uh, we got back to the States and some things happened with music was changing. I mean, none of the labels were going to sign a long haired rock yeah. and roll band. They were looking for the next knack, the next blondie, the next uh devo you know and these these record company people are telling us you got to get rid of the long hair you got to get get rid of the leave the leather and, and levi's and, and get some skinny ties and one guy from a label actually gave each one of us a stack of records so this is what's coming in and we're like no we just got back from europe there was lines around the block four people wide for a block long standing in the snow for hours to see us because the word was out that there was a really yeah, hot yeah. band from america there and so i just finally I kind of just gave up in doing somebody else's thing at that point. I go, well, shit, if everybody's going to turn us down, I might as well do my own thing. I write music. I can front a band. I've fronted it all my life. Yeah, that's, so, why, I gonna, yeah, that's why I was going to ask you, because you told me, like, when I interviewed you the last time, that um, you've always been a singer. So I could see, like, when an opportunity like uh, to join a band like Dawkins or Quiet Riot comes up, oh, yeah, sure, I'll I'll, I'll join the band. You know, this, yeah. these bands have potential. But um, was that, like, the main reason you left? Because you like, well, there can't be two singers in Dawkin, you know, so I want well, to kind of do my own thing. Actually, when Don and I were playing together, we played off each other a lot. It was mostly him, but I sang lead on a few songs, and I definitely sang backups. And Gary Holland was the other guy in the band who was from me, from Sweet 19, oh. and I got him in the band. And we, and then we had Gary Link, who later went on to join Stop It Wolf, and he, they just retired now. And uh, we had four-part harmonies. I mean, it was like Boston. It was beautiful. Oh, wow. But there was so much bullshit and lies and, and just, you know, things over exaggerated. And again, the music was changing. I didn't want to be in Devo. I didn't want to be in the Knack. Yeah. I, I like yeah. the Knack. You know, yeah. I knew Doug Figer. He was one of my customers at my shop. Nice guy. Uh, really nice guy. But anyways, you know, I just figured, well, shit, if I'm going to be doing this, I might as well just do my own thing. If You know, if I fail, well, at least I was doing what I want to do instead of somebody else's dream. So I called up... Uh, Tommy Lee, who was my drummer in Sweet 19, right before I left with with uh, Kevin and uh, Drew and stuff. And I told him when I left that, I, you know, let me go and make a name for myself. And when I come back, we'll put the band back together. So sure enough, I called uh, Tom when I got back and uh, we were out looking for a band uh, for a bass player. And uh, we went to I think it was London's last show with uh, Nikki Six and, you wow. know, those guys. And uh, afterwards, I think we. I introduced him to Nikki because he loved Nikki. Yeah. And I'd already, you know, I knew Nikki couldn't play, so I wasn't interested. I loved the way he looked. He had a great image. And he's a super cool dude, but he wasn't the musician that I wanted to play with. He yeah. he wouldn't be able to back what I do. So I told Tom, I go, Tom, he's not gonna be the right guy for this band. You know, we're more like going towards like what Rainbow's doing. Yeah. And uh, you know, and what much more musical. And I want to go heavier, you know. And uh but he loved uh, Nikki, and I said, you know what, dude? If that's what you want to do, please just do what you want to do. You got to be happy. I got to ask, you, ask you this, Greg, because um, first of all, I was curious. Did you ever see the Molly Crew movie, The Dirt? Of course. And I got to ask, what what did you think of the scene at the beginning, where which I'm sure was a kind of fabricated, where Tommy and Nikki meet in some club, and he's like, oh, that never man, happened. Nick, Nikki, that never happened. I'm such a fan. <laughs> that <laughs> never happened. There's so much bullshit in that movie. And I hate to swear because I know yeah, kids yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. there's yeah. so much shit that is not true in that movie. And that guy in the beginning go, Greg, aren't you offended? I go, that's not me. Yeah. I never played with them. I refused them right off the bat. Tom wanted me in the band. Wow. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be in a band with Nikki only because I want to do something that's more musical instead of yeah. a bass player hitting quarter notes and eighth notes. Yeah. And I didn't want to be just a guitar player anymore. I wanted to be doing what I want to do. My favorite guitar players. Frank Marino, Jimi Hendrix, Robin, not, not so much Robin Chower, now he sings, but yeah. uh, all my favorite guys, they all sang. Probably you know, Eric Clapton, you know, they're guitar player singers. And my dad always says, what in the hell, Greg, you sing better than any of these guys. <clears throat> do your own thing. Everybody knows who you are around here. You pack out everywhere you play, just yeah. do your own thing. So after a while, I just figured, you know what, I, maybe dad's right. So, you know, so what year was it when you'd say you'd, you'd formed the first ver uh, version of a, a Greg Leon invasion? 1981. And it happened. I went to, uh, oh, God. I, it was a concert. And I can't remember the name of the concert. But everybody was there. Dawkins was playing. 
I don't know if Doc was playing. Van Halen was playing. Uh, I score. It was everybody, and there was a kid in front of me sitting down, and it said Van Halen World Invasion, and I kept looking at the word invasion. I'm going, man, right. that's a powerful word. That's what I want to do. I want to invade the world. Yeah. And so I I brought back to my guys. I came back to rehearsal the next night. I go, guys, what do you think of the band Greg Leon Invasion? They all go. It's awesome. Let's do it. So that's how the name started. It was that. I simple. might add years before the Vinnie Vincent invasion. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, yeah. It was way before Vinnie Vincent. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, I had to have my lawyer go after the label because they stole it because he was using one of my old managers, a guy named Todd Cooper. And Todd told him, you should just call it the Vinnie Vincent invasion. And I get this call from the head of the label from Chrysalis telling me I got to drop the name. And I'm going, who the hell is this? And what do you what do you mean I let drop it? Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah, you know. So, anyways, we came to an agreement. I had to quit using the name. They gave me some money. Yeah. And I went from selling out every single place I played to drawing 20 or 30 people because nobody knew when the hell we were playing. Wow. And it just was way up here, and then it just went down low. And I didn't the guys in the band and the new band, they didn't want to uh they wanted a band name, which which is why I had it invasion because the Greg and the invasion yeah, was yeah. the band. And uh, I should have just called it Greg Leon because that's what everybody came come to see anyways is what I'm yeah. doing. Yeah, and you know, Greg, um, any time I've ever talked to you, interviewed you in the past, um, you've never shied away or been ashamed of like being associated with um, you know either Quiet Riot or Dubro or or Doc, and, and and you you should be because it's a huge thing to kind oh, of have on on your resume. But my question I, is. Do you ever get tired of that tag, like X Quiet Riot, X Doc and Guitar? No, no, I, I don't. And there was a time I didn't want to do it, and I hated it. And uh -huh. now I really embrace it because those were two of the biggest bands of the 80s. You know, yeah. and uh, I'm the only guy that can say I was Randy Rhodes' first pick to replace him in Quiet Riot. And let's look at Nobody it. else in the whole world can say that but me. And, and look at this, too. I mean, the fact that, like I was saying in the top interview, um, you know, you were – Involved in the LA rock scene early on, and um, you were played. Well, I should say, like you, you were the Dawkins and Quiet Riot, as we mentioned. You know, uh, you replaced Randy Rose, and then you know George Lynch replaced you and Dawkins. I mean, two of the uh, biggest guitar players of all time. So, yeah. But to be in that cat, like, to be in that um, league of players, I think that says you know it, it's lot. huge. You know, we we went back to the East Coast and. Uh, you know, all the club owners love the music that and my old manager booked this. Mm -hmm. But part of the deal was I had to play a dock and, and a quiet ride. So I go, I'm not going to play any quiet ride songs just for my love for Randy as a friend out of right. respect. And we're just not. And how do you sing, you know, Kevin DeBro's voice? I mean, that guy's got the most distinctive voice. So I agreed to do a dock and tune. We did Breaking the Chains. And as soon as we started that, the whole crowd every night went crazy. And we always ended with that song mm -hmm. as an encore. Crowd went crazy, and I looked at because I, for years, would not play anybody, any other band that I was in music, because I wrote all my own stuff. But we did have a good time, I got to say, and the people loved it, and uh, they really appreciated it because it's just, I mean, not many people do that. And I, I never wanted to to rest on my laurels and say, oh, I'm sure, formerly sure. this, formerly that. You know, it's like you got your own talent, thing. your own thing going. That's why I was asking that. Yeah. Um, but, but it always comes up, and, and I love the fact, I do love the fact that you embrace it as opposed to like some people might uh, try to run away from it, you know? Well, I was really proud of the Dokken thing. I, I know that a lot of people over the years, even Don himself, has told me the band that we had together was the most fun and the best band that he ever had. Number one, there was no fighting. Nobody was worried about money. None of us had our hands out looking for money. We were there for the music and the music only, and it was great. People that saw us in L.A. and over in Europe, loved it they all loved it because it was real rock and roll i mean and we had harmonies like boston i mean it was wonderful sure, yeah yeah hey and have you ever met george lynch or had opportunity to get up on stage with him we did a show together at a place called the malibu inn a few years back quite a few years back now and it's online it, you okay. can look it up yeah, yeah. and it's at the malibu inn i don't remember the year yeah, yeah, but yeah. uh i remember he was playing with vinnie vincent up uh, vinnie vincent vinnie um Vinny Apice was the drummer in his band. Oh, and uh, I, I own an incredible drum set. It's a, a 1963 Ludwig kit with a tw two 28 inch bass drums, 14, 16, 18 with a gong and, you know, all the other stuff. And, and uh, uh, what was I going to say? Dang it. Anyway, so Vinny Vincent, I mean, Vin, God, I mean, 
Vinny Appice is always on the, the whole time was on the side of the stage. Now, he's one of my all time favorite drummers. So I'm like, I got to show this guy what we're about. Yeah, so yeah. we come off stage and he just goes, now that's a drum set. And, and my drummer, Greg Stevens at the time, he gave Greg some, some good props, you know, about his playing and stuff. And uh, George, it was kind of funny because I went backstage because George and I have been friends since the yeah. 70s when he had a band called Exciter and the boys, we used to open for them at the Starwood. Oh, wow. And I, I don't know if he even wanted to go on after us because the band was so tight and the crowd was right, you know, in the palm of our hands the yeah. whole time. And I knew we were killing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would kind of went backstage to kind of strut around, you know, and and uh, I loved George. George is one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet. And it's very sarcastic humor, which I love. And uh, some might say it's mean spirited, but you have to know that that's just yeah, yeah. a sense of humor. So, uh, but yeah, that's the only time that we ever played to, uh, on a gig together uh, oh, after, after the docking thing. And I even say this is the, the only gig where you're going to get two former docking guitar players there on the same yeah. film. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like I said, my co host Tom and you have a lot in common. You guys are both great songwriters, singers, guitar players. So, Tom, I'm going to throw it to you so you and um, Greg can talk shop as I know you like to do. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, I, you probably know Ripper Owens. Ripper Owens and I play a lot together too. Him and I, we do a double bill where He'll sing half the night and I'll sing the other half of my band oh, and cool. stuff like that. Yeah, um, but the question I really have for you is, is two questions. Are you doing a new record? Any plans for that? Any plans for touring, playing live? Well, I love your music. And thank I'm you. part of the record company too. So I was listening to your music. I was just curious if you were doing another album and stuff. Well, we I'm working on a new album right now. You know, <clears throat> the last album I did, uh, we got a deal worldwide release through uh, um, or The Orchard, Universal, The Orchard, yeah. Yeah. Sony. And, but no labels do anything anymore. We yeah, got yeah. the record. It took almost a year to get it out. I mean, and we're just sitting around, you know, what the hell's going on? You know, what? why we signed with you guys. You said you're going to promote us. It's that and the other. So finally, about 11 and a half months later, the record comes out. They do no promotion. They expect us to do everything. I had three record offers, three record deal offers besides the Sony one. And I'll tell you, it made us sick. You were just so disgusted because you know you work so hard to get something done so anyways we got that done i call him i start complaining you know i'm like a squeaky wheel in the thing and i go you know my line six on my contract says you guys are going to promote as needed to move the record yeah. what have you guys done what have you done the guy couldn't answer I go, you haven't done anything we've been looking every day the guys in the band were all saying well you know you can get it everywhere punching greg lee on invasion and uh tell the children's the name of the record it's everywhere but what are you doing to let people know about it? It's such a that's such a disappointment there because um like um I interviewed you about it when the album first came out. Um yeah. super album, killer, killer tunes. I mean, um a lot of it and, and I, I'm um I'm sure it's just kind of it's the music type of music you do, but it does kind of sound it's like it's, it's melodic hard rock, it's a little bit of yeah. everything, got kind of got that Dawkins sound. I sure. mean um well part of the, the Dawkins sound was what I brought to him. That he wanted. It, that's why he wanted me to play with him. So course. that's, it, I mean, that, it just rubbed off on Don. That's the built-in ingredient in, in the music. And and one of my favorite tunes, I love all the tunes, but um, I, I think that it's a shame. It, um, it could have been a huge radio hit if they had promoted this, right? Hold on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everybody yeah. says, I was just up in Canada, and my wife and I are friends with uh, this guy, Rod Macbeth, who was like one of the biggest disc jockeys up there in Canada. He's like uh, our Jim Ladd down here. Everybody mm -hmm. knows him. He's up there and he loves that record, but he's out of the business. And he said the exact same thing you did. He goes, that record is a hit, that song. It's a shame that, you know, I'm not still in the business. I could help you out and start playing that because it would get some. Let me go. Let me give me one second break here. Sure, sure, Look, sure. Wow. What Super, a great guy. Super talented guy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's history he has, too. You know, yeah. I'm surprised at the orchard. I wonder the day I was going to ask him. If they ask him. Yeah. Ask him. Yeah. This when is the talking. record, the Tell the Children record. Uh -huh. I want okay, everybody so to go at it. least give it a listen. Go online and give it a listen if you like it. All go, over YouTube. You can check out the whole album. It. It's, a, yep. it's yeah. all there, but buy it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Nobody yeah. buys records no more. Yeah, yeah. You know? So it's, afterwards, we did this record. Um, I I had bought a 24-track machine. I did this on a 16-track a, a tape machine. Well, I upgraded to a 24-track tape machine and bought all kinds of new equipment thinking a bunch of money was going to come in because I know this record's so good and nobody's doing this kind of music anymore. That's just real rock and roll and, you know, really heartfelt with the great, uh, you know, the, the kind of the classic tones, not, you know, 
this nonsense that's going on now where they're playing cowboy chords. And I mean, it takes you back riff. to that 80s rock scene we were talking about that you were such a big part of, you know? You know, when we play out live, people go absolutely crazy. We just did the whiskey. Yeah. And I'm just trying to squeeze a lot into a half an hour. I'd love to go an hour because it's going. But we did the whiskey on the, um, what was it, May 31st. And uh, it was a Wednesday night. But we promoted the crap out of it. And another band, a Nikki Carula band, was headlining. And we were supporting. There was two opening acts. We played and the crowd went absolutely crazy. 147 paid that night on a Wednesday night. Nobody's doing that anymore. And I mean, people were taking pictures of my pedal board. They're getting pictures of my guitar. I'm like, what the hell's going on? Even if they get those, the, all the pedals on, it's still not going to sound like them. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I had a thing where we went in the studio with... Uh, with Dieter Dirks and uh, you know, I got a phenomenal guitar sound and uh, Don could not get a guitar sound. We even plugged through my stuff. It didn't sound the same. And <laughs> Dieter looks at me and he goes, you know what? It really is in the hands. And it really is, yeah. you know, Eddie picks up a guitar. It doesn't matter if he's playing acoustic, you know, it's Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. You, you know, the thing Greg is if you were to go in the studio and, and have some producer come in and tell you, you know what, this, this stuff sounds like from the seventies, you need to record like more modern day. It would it would come out sounding so you know forced or so fake. Um, it's possible. You, know, yeah. you got to deliver what you what, what you do. You know your thing. Yeah. yeah. I just got a call and, and I'm gonna do it to the. Uh, I can't tell who the people are, but it's European band, one of the biggest bands. They came and saw me play at the Universal Amphitheater. I mean Universal, uh, uh, not Universal Amphitheater, the Universal Bar and Grill. Okay. And we did a record release party there, and uh, the bass player from this band showed up. Well, they get in touch with me like a year later. They've been talking about me, talking about me, and they've got an album. they got a budget. They're going to take me and put me up. They want me to come in, and they go, just do what you do. We're not going to tell you anything. Do what you do on this record. And I'm saying, I'm in. Because if I get to learn somebody else's stuff, I'm not interested. You know, I do what I do, and if you like it, that's phenomenal. If you don't, then go to the next band. It's all right. Yeah, and again, I know you played the whiskey plenty of times, but what was the latest show like? I mean, uh, did you get a good reception? A lot of people come that night. This last one? Yeah, this is the latest yeah, one. Yeah, we had a 147 paid on a Wednesday night. Wow, it was great. We actually got a, a nice check. That I never made money playing there before ever. And the thing that was weird, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't know they were doing a meet and greet. So people paid a hundred dollars for a meet and greet and they get a booth. There's six people in a booth. There was two booths full. I had no idea this. Time. And a lot of the guys were people I went to school with. that hadn't seen me since school, you know, and they brought their kids with them. It was so yeah. fun. And the crowd, they just loved us. I mean, because it's real. I mean, it's from the opening note uh, that she, you know, we open up with, she wants me. And uh, from the opening note on that, even the sound men at soundcheck were just like, they were like just hanging on, you know, all the song they wanted us to keep playing. I go, we've got, to, we've got to save something for tonight, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blow my voice out at sound check or something. Yeah, yeah. So um, how do you go about, um, how, like, the, the latest uh, gig you did at the Whiskey? Um, talk about the set list. Like, how, how much uh, of it is classic uh, Greg Leon material versus the new album? It's about 50-50. We do about half of the new record. We do a lot of stuff off the Wishing Well record. And uh, we... D I. Th we, we don't do anything off of the uh, women and children, uh, women and children, uh, guitars, cars, and women. That That's so old. Not that I wouldn't want to, but the band was kind of new. We've been working on, you know, new, new music that I'm writing. So uh, there was about, I think we did about 14 songs and it was mostly, you know, the new record and then the, the, uh, uh, Wishing Well record, which the I love. Well, I love that music. The, the Wishing Well album. I, I love that. I totally forgot about it. Um, who did you do that with? Who were the other guys in the band? I forgot. The drummer is the drummer from Survivor, Mark Jubé. Oh, you know, okay. I have the Tiger, phenomenal yeah, yeah, drummer. Yeah. And it's a funny thing. We found him through the Musician Contact Service. And me and the, the bass player, Stuart Brooks, who was in uh, Black Cat Bones. I mean, he grew up with uh, Paul uh, Kossoff. And they had bands together, you know, from Free. Free, wow. And, uh, so anyway, so we were playing together for nine years. We played an amazing bass player. Amazing. Uh -huh. And... Um, we went to the musician's contact service and we see, you know, you know, claim to fame or whatever. I of the tiger. That's our guy, you wow. know, so solid. So we call him up. He comes out to my studio. He takes one look at the bass drum and he stands in front of it. And he goes, I'll do it. He hadn't even heard the music yet, but he knew <laughs> if I had that kind of a drum set that he wanted to be involved with it. So I wrote all the music and uh, some of the music I wrote with Stuart and, uh, 
<clears throat> we'd work on a tune, come back the next day and track it, work up another tune, come back the next day and track it. And we did that. And uh, he was going to be in the band, but then Sur Survivor got put back together. Yeah, yeah. So we actually never played a gig together. And now he's retired. He's hurt his uh, meniscus and some uh -huh. other stuff. Wow. And he had, I think he had to have some feet stuff done. But drummers, that's a tough gig, man. Yeah, Playing yeah. hard like that when you get in your 60s and stuff. Yeah, wow. But uh, yeah, he's a great drummer and the record's got a great feel. And again, you know, you know, uh, oh man, there's so many things to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you well, know, with well, the Spotify. Yeah, back, Gracie, the thing is just that the Zoom thing, they, they want you to pay to do more than like 30 minutes. And what happens, 30 minutes, it kicks you off <laughs> like right in the middle call, of the talk call me back in a minute we'll do another 30 minutes great okay sure sure let's, we're, let's we're, do it okay do it right now i'll, I'll wait okay well, well we'll just finish this part up but yeah. um yeah let me ask you now um doc and you know they're getting ready to release um what many think is going to be their final studio album. you know doc, don's had all these health issues um as a performer yourself what not to knock anybody but what do you think about him um going out performing live and when he has these issues with his voice and stuff well, you know, I talked to Don not too long ago, and uh, we're still friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it hurts me to see him playing out live yeah. because I know what he used to be. Yeah, yeah. And the, the fans loved what he used to be. And just to go out and to me, it's kind of ruining your legacy if you can't really do it anymore. And yeah. and again, I love Don. I love the band. I love the music. I've always been a Dawkins fan, even, you know. After I left, I still, I loved the band. I loved, you know, his voice and the harmony. The guy's a genius with harmonies, but it's just not there no more. Yeah. yeah. And they don't sound, you know, from what I've been seeing online. Yeah, I, I, think think it's, I think it's great releasing maybe what's going to be the final album. But it's now, out. It's out. The new record, I think, is out because I've seen a couple of cuts off it. Yeah. See, they've released a couple of singles, but it comes out officially in October, at the end of October. Oh, okay. And, okay. Um, I think it's cool that if that's going to be the final album. And like you're saying, it'd be cool to kind of go out on top. And this is the last album. We'll put out a couple yeah. of videos. Well, and last time I last time I spoke to Don was right. He called me right after uh, Jeff Beck passed away. So, wow. You know, we were all everybody that's a good, good guitar player loves Jeff Beck. And we're talking and I go, so what's going on with Doc? And what are you, where are you guys at? And he goes, well, I'm thinking about retiring. He goes, as soon as I turn 70, that's it. I'm done. He goes, my next birthday. So I don't know if his birthday's come to pass yet or whatever, but you know, I'm, I'll probably go to the whiskey show and see him just because there won't be any other chance to see him probably. Now, obviously, going going as a supporter as a former bandmate and friend, but um, you think any chance that they might invite you up on stage, or are you just going as? I, I doubt it, but we did talk about me going out and doing some shows with them, and he was like all for it. He goes, "Dude, it would be great. We got it would be you opening the show, Greg, George, wow. and the support act, and then Doc and headlining." And then George coming up and doing some of the hits with us. And I thought that was great. So he goes, let me look into it. And he said, every club wanted the opening acts to pay like $1,500 to $2,000 to open up. Yeah, but Whiskey's putting on some great show that I just seen they have a show coming up with uh, all people, Glenn Hughes and opening act is Gilby Clark. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what, you guys, um, let me, um, we're going to end uh, part one of the interview. I'm going to um, send you guys a new link and then we'll, um, do the part two as Greg requested. And, and let your partner talk this time, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, we will, we will, I promise. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>